Et, et bonjour, donc c'est un grand honneur de recevoir ce prix. Ça représente, je pense, 25 ans au moins de collaboration avec des collègues français. Et bon, euh, je vais passer à l'anglais parce que c'est plus facile pour moi. Il y a même des mots que je ne connais pas euh, en français. Et donc, uh, um, so I, I would like to give you an idea about the work we have been doing in Aveiro in the last 20 years or so. Not, not everything, of course, but I will select uh, some of the, uh, some of the, um, some of the work which probably gives you um, a better feeling about what we are, we have been doing. So uh, as an outline of our, my talk, I will concentrate on nanoporosilicates, uh, properties and applications, in particular light emission by lanthanide silicates, nanoporous lanthanide silicates, and I'll give you one example of uh, uh, an application which has been translated into, uh, uh, into the clinic. And then there's a lot of work we've been doing on uh, hybrid materials, on organic, inorganic hybrid materials, metal organic frameworks, but not just metal organic frameworks. And I'll give you a number of examples. Molecules and temperature sensing is one of the examples. It's just a coincidence that uh, yesterday the Medicine Nobel Prize was given for uh, sensor, human sensors, of course, temperature and pressure sensors. So I'll tell you a little bit about non-human uh, temperature sensors. Applications in anti-mosquito nets, which of course could, could be useful for the developing world. And, and then I will broaden up a little bit on other types of hybrids, photoresponsive organic and organic hybrid ferroelectric materials. And I also f uh, would like to finish, hope I have time for that, uh, in revisiting uh, an old problem Einstein had, the Brownian motion uh, using nano thermometry. So I don't think I need to explain what a nanoporous material is to this audience. Zeolites, of course, are the most important nanoporous materials. And what we have uh, is a silicate material, uh, which has uh, channels um, uh, with a section diameter of the order of the small molecules, typically one nanometer. And as the framework is negatively charged, of course, we need to have some balancing of cations, sodium cations, perhaps, or other types of cations. And also, uh, molecules can be uh, uh, guests in, in these uh, structures, uh, uh, normally water molecules, but of course, they can be uh, changed by other types of molecules, and that's the principle of many applications. And what we've done many years ago was to uh, look at conventional zeolites, which are built up of these four fold units. So we have basically a silicon or an aluminum atom, perhaps a phosphorus atom, uh, surrounded by four oxygens. And then these oxygens breach uh, other silicon or phosphorus or aluminum atoms. And basically, we have this uh, uh, unit, which is a tetrahedron, and that's the brick. The, the main brick that builds up the structures. But we said, why cannot we have a different type of brick and then make different structures? And so we thought maybe if we have octahedra, for example, we could build up uh, new, new types of structures and perhaps have new functions. And so we had a look into minerals and we found that there were minerals in nature, rare minerals, mainly titanium silicates, uh, where indeed the basic building block was an octahedron, TiO6 octahedron. And so we decided to explore this uh, uh, endless world, uh, uh, different transition metals, and later uh, lanthanide metals. So our materials are similar to zeolites, but they are very different because they are not aluminum uh, silicates. They are based on transition metals and lanthanide ions. And so this was uh, perhaps um, one of my first papers uh, when I went back to Portugal from, from Cambridge and in collaboration with Mike Anderson and Osamu Terazaki, good friends, we were looking at the structure of this titanium silicate ETS-10. And you can see this is a high resolution electron micrograph and you, ca you can just about see the, the pores running perpendicular to the screen. And you can see this is a highly disordered material 
uh, you even have merging of uh, uh, pores. And uh, of course, this could not be solved. This is a powder, highly disordered powder, so we had to use uh, X-ray diffraction, electron, uh, high resolution electron microscopy, and solid state and MR. Uh, as it was mentioned, solid state and MR is one of my main tools. I'm not going to talk about solid state and MR today. I will concentrate on materials only. But we could read out almost the structure from the electron micrographs uh, and then with the other techniques solve it. And this was a landmark for my work. And it's still quoted this paper 25 years later. And so by exploring titanium silicates, uh, and later other transition metal silicates and lanthanide silicates, we could find many different structures. For example, here we have uh, in, in all uh, uh, structures in, in uh, blue, we have the SiO4 tetrahedra, and in green, the, uh, normally uh, the, the metal polyhedra. And you can see that sometimes the polyhedra are isolated. Sometimes you have clusters. Sometimes you have layers, so not only framework materials, but also two-dimensional materials. And in some cases, something in between. For example, this material has per, uh, perforated layers. So it's a layered material, but with sort of uh, channels running perpendicular to the layers, and all sorts of uh, uh, different types of layer, complicated layers, and so on. So altogether, we made over 20, 50 different framework and layered uh, materials and then of course many more by changing composition and so on and these were the main uh, uh, metals used in our work. And so I would like to give you some applications, an overview of some applications. Uh, I will flash through some of them and I'll concentrate on some I, I, I think are more interesting. And so, for example, gas option separation. Of course, when you make something like a zeolite, you want to explore properties people normally study uh, uh, with zeolites. And gas option and separation of, is, of course, uh, uh, an important field. So we were able to make uh, membranes uh, of a particular uh, uh, microporous material here, glued to a mesoporous alumina, and this is a top tubular support. And with this, we could uh, separate hydrogen from nitrogen at 60 C, with, uh, uh, even in the presence of water, by a factor of about 40. Uh, more recently, in collaboration with uh, Bosch Thermoelectrics, which actually is based close to Aveiro, uh, we were able to uh, use uh, ETS-10 water pair, so titanium silicate, uh, water pair uh, to uh, uh, implement cyclic adsorption systems for heating applications. So very, very applied work engineering of the interest uh, of, of a company. And of course, catalysis is another field of applications. We did a lot of work on heter heterogeneous catalysis. And for example, using a certain niobium silicate, we, uh, we called AM11, uh, we have higher furfural hills than obtained with uh, zeolite HY or modernite, or perhaps uh, using, the, again, the, the titanium silicate ETS-10, we were able to convert isopropanol to acetone with better yields than zeolite X. So in a number of cases, our materials actually perform as heterogeneous catalysts better than uh, uh, more common zeolites. Uh, ion exchange, of course, is another property which is important uh, in zeolite chemistry. And uh, we concentrated uh, late, uh, lately on uh, trying to use our materials to uh, um, absorb or to ion exchange, uh, I would say, dangerous metals such as mercury and cadmium. And for example, uh, <coughs> ETS-4, which is another titanium silicate, is very good at uh, um, purifying uh, waters, removing uh, mercury from, from uh, wastewater. And the same goes for cadmium. So this may have, these materials may have real applications. But now I, I, would, I would like to concentrate on perhaps what is more original, because these type of properties you do not usually see with common zeolites. So we, we made lanthanide silicates, as I, I mentioned. And why lanthanide? Well, lanthanides, uh, um, three plus ions, are very interesting because uh, they are on the basis, they are photoluminescence. They, they, the materials bearing these uh, uh, ions are photoluminescent. So if you take, say, a white powder containing europium, 
white and the visible light shine UV light, and that's what it returns. It returns red light. It shines red. And this is the basis. Uh, or these materials are much applied, for example, in LEDs, in tunable lasers, low energy scintillators, and amplifiers for optical communications and storage. So they're quite important uh, um, elements. <clears throat> So this was one of the first uh, lanthanide silicates, nanoporous lanthanide silicates we made. We have here uh, in purple SiO4 tetrahedra, some channels running through, and then uh, these sort of layers you see here, uh, they contain lanthanide ions and sodium ions. <clears throat> And uh, when uh, we can change, of course, the lanthanide, we can, we can make this structure with different lanthanides. And then when you uh, make the structure with terbium, uh, uh, you, you have a surprise. So one day I was sitting in my office and a student rushes in and says, well, I saw green light. So I said, okay, good for you, but uh, explain what, what's, what's that. So it, it, it took the, the sample to the, our X-ray diffractometer, and this is what he saw. It was returning green light. And uh, this was comparable to uh, the material we were using to align our X-ray beams uh, provided by Philips at the time. Then we they just took a, a, a spectrometer um, um, to the machine, to the XRD machine, and just measure the spectra, and that's what you get. And we compared, by integrating the areas, we could see that our material at about 60 to 70 percent of the uh, uh, emission uh, of, uh, of the Philips material, but our material is extremely light. So in a conference, there was a guy from uh, military applications who came to me because he thought this could be interesting. I don't know for what purpose. Uh, if instead of terbium, you use erbium, then uh, in a dehydrated material, you have uh, infrared emission at the right uh, wavelength for optical fibers. So another possible application could be here. And then, of course, you can use these as, uh, uh, for sensing because you can combine porosity with light emission. But as I will show you in a moment, uh, we are very much interested in this uh, uh, in thermometry, so in, uh, in, in temperature sensors. And this was the first example of a temperature sensor um, um, measured with light uh, using a silicate. Uh, we also we have also used these materials in other applications, for example, in MRI con as MRI contrast agents. And I think this was a paper in common with, with Eva. I'm not sure if this was the right one. but uh, So we, we basically uh, uh, um, evaluated the possibility of using suspensions of these uh, lanthanide bearing materials uh, as contrast agents, and we found that they are good T2 contrast agents, not, T1, not good T1 contrast agents. Um, we also uh, wanted to know whether we could use these materials to deliver NO in biological conditions. And uh, uh, the titanium silicate TTS4 is actually very good because it stores a lot of NO and it delivers it not in a burst, but over 24 hours. And of course, NO is extremely fundamental in, in a number of biological processes, such as vasodilatation, wound repair, and so on. But this was perhaps totally unexpected, because one of the worst materials we made worst, because the, it is an extremely small porous material, so we almost didn't bother to publish it, because it was useless for catalysis or something. Uh, but it turned out, many years later, that it has medical applications. It's a sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, which is, which is now used it's on, on the market to treat excess potassium in blood hyperkalemia. Um, so hyperkalemia in this condition where uh, uh, whenever you have over five millimole per liter of potassium in blood, then you, have, uh, this pro you can die of this thing. So it's common in patients with chronic, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, heart failure, and, and a few other conditions. Uh, and what is, uh, uh, what is solid, because it is a solid does, uh, it sells under the name Lokelma, is it binds potassium in your gastrointestinal tract, uh, and uh, it goes out on the other side, and it decreases uh, potassium levels after one hour following 10 grams. So you just eat 10 grams and that's it, uh, five or 10 grams. And it has a very large potassium binding capacity 
um, um, for potassium compared with, with calcium, much more so than the, the polymer resins which were used previously, and they are still used, uh, and, and it is much more selective for potassium than the resins are. Plus, when you eat one of these resins, you just feel you are totally full. Uh, it's not comfortable. And uh, so a company, uh, the ZS Pharma, was founded in 2008 to explore the, this, uh, it's a zirconium silicate, I'll show you in a moment. Um, and eventually it was bought in 2015 by AstraZeneca by a huge amount of money, and later was uh, uh, approved uh, by the European and American um, agencies. And I was I had a project with them, helping uh, bringing this to, well, solving some problems. And that, that's the, the package, so normally it sells for about $259 in America. Uh, and it's interesting because this is one side of the box. If you look at the other side of the box, that's what you see. And to me, it reads like uh, uh, flies and something to catch flies. So, and, and if you look carefully, this tries to emulate a sort of a structure. So basically, they, they compare the ability of this uh, 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 drug to uh, capture potassium to the ability of a fly catcher to catch flies, which I thought it was very, very interesting um, idea. Well, that's the paper, the original paper we published uh, a zirconium silicate structure, uh, which is the, the, the basically the, 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 the drug. And this is the structure. It doesn't look porous because the spores are very, very small. So it's a sodium zirconium silicate. You can see our material has sodium, a lot of sodium and chlo chlorine, and it's not good for your health. So they, they preserve the structure, but they modify it in such a way that you do not have any chlorine anymore and you have less sodium. That's the only difference. The structure is the same. So if you cut away in order to see the, 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 the pores, the small pores, that's what you get. And uh, if that's a potassium ion, it fits perfectly well into the, the pore. Of course, the real life is much more complicated. The structure has a little bit of flexibility, but that, that's how it works. And so if you compare the, the, this, this hole with, uh, when it's filled with potassium, uh, uh, to the situation where you have sodium and calcium, then you see why it, it works so well. And so exchange of sodium for potassium is about 20 kilocalories per mole more stable. It's uh, interesting because we have uh, potassium channels in our uh, body. They work far better, of course. But nevertheless, so we have uh, this potassium uh, uh, channel protein, it's a tetramer made up of four identical subunits in different colors here, and then you have this channel, and each subunit has two transmembrane spanning alpha helices here. So there is some uh, mimicking of the biological processes. So now I change a little bit the subject because I would like to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, um, metal organic frameworks and, and then the hybrid materials, sometimes also known as coordination polymers when, when you have no porosity. But this is one example uh, from our lab uh, um, with lanthanide ions. Um, and what you see is, of course, you have clusters of metals and the structure is stitched, or these clusters are stitched by these sort of uh, uh, organic, or by these organic molecules, and, so, and you can get uh, channels as well. And of course, the world record of uh, <coughs> um, uh, surface area is still, I think, still belongs to uh, these metal organic frameworks. I don't know if it's any more at 10,000 square meters per gram. Maybe it's higher than that. I just uh, do not care anymore about that. And so uh, by combining uh, the, the porosity of these metal organic frameworks with lanthanides, we can, of course, apply these to uh, make sensors and in this particular case, sensors of molecules. So uh, what we have here is uh, one example where we have eight and nine coordinated uh, um, europium uh, oxygen uh, polyhedra. And you can see there are two types of channels here. I don't want, I, I want to go into details. That's the molecule which, which uh, links uh, the clusters. And with this uh, uh, structure, 
we could actually make an ethanol sensor. So if you measure fluorescence as a function of time, and if you pass a current uh, wet with, uh, uh, with uh, alcohol ethanol, fluorescence goes down. And then if you pass a current dry, it goes up, up and down, and so on. And so it's re uh, uh, there's a repeatability, and uh, the, it, the response is a matter of seconds. So this shows we have an ethanol sensor. This was work done in collaboration with Avelino Corma and Fernando Rey in Valencia. And we also made a pH sensor. And that's a sort of a layered structure. Um, it's not exactly a moth, it's an hybrid material uh, <coughs> with layers. And what is important, this is the, the, the linker. And what is important is that there are two types of local environments for the lanthanide ions. In one case, we have dimers. In the other case, we have dimer, uh, monomers. And dimers have OH groups and water molecules uh, in the coordination sphere. And therefore, they are sensitive to, to pH. And so if we measure fluorescence, this is just an expansion of the emission spectrum. If you measure fluorescence, fluorescence uh, uh, what you see is you have one ONP as a function of pH, you can see that it changes, this band changes while this band doesn't change because this comes from the monomer who has no water molecules or H groups in the vicinity. And so if you plot this, you get a straight line in the range of, uh, in the pH range of, um, of biological interest. So this is a self-calibrated pH sensor uh, based on an organic and organic hybrid. But I would like to tell you a little bit about temperature sensing, uh, because that's one of our interests. And of course, everybody knows what a contact thermometer is. You want to measure the temperature of a certain object. You need to put your thermometer in contact with, uh, with that body. But there are, of course, other ways of measuring temperature without uh, 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 putting a body in contact with another body. Sometimes it's impossible if you want to measure temperature on something which is flying or something which is inside a very strong magnetic field, whatever, then you need other ways. And uh, light is a way of assessing temperature. And uh, sensors based on, on light are normally non-invasive or almost non-invasive. They work remotely by optical detection and they are self-calibrated. And uh, this is the case of our, uh, of our systems. So we just, uh, to give you an example, we just took some uh, uh, metal organic framework from the literature. Uh, we did not make it, make it uh, ourselves the first time. We just took it from literature, and that's the structure. I won't detail it, but basically you have the metal ions again, and the uh, uh, molecule is here, uh, uh, building up the structure. And, and uh, this was done by uh, spray drying in collaboration with Daniel Masposh uh, in Barcelona. Uh, and that's a very convenient way of making this because you can make large amounts. This is, you can scale it up. Essentially what you do is you feed reactants from left and, and right, so the, the linker and the metal, uh, and they come together the, uh, uh, here, and they spray it for, uh, from this nose into this hot chamber, and the solvent starts evaporating from the center to the periphery, it uh, super concentrates, eventually crystallizes, and produces these sort of hollow structures. And if you then apply ultrasounds, you can get individual nano crystals. So you can make nanomorphs uh, of uh, this uh, material uh, uh, and then use it in thermometry. And uh, how does it work? If you shine UV light, which is then captured by the organic molecule, uh, and if you have two different lanthanides in the material, which you can, you can do, uh, europium and terbium, or another suitable pair, then you have two emissions, so UV light uh, on the organic molecule, energy transfer, emission from europium and terbium. And now, if you monitor the emission of europium terbium as a function of temperature, so going down from room temperature to, to 25 kel. So what you see is that there is a lot of difference in the terbium emission lines, some difference in the europium uh, emission lines. And then if you plot the, the, the areas of these lines, europium and terbium, and then plot the ratio as a function of temperature, this is what you get. And the ratio of the emissions, you see that above 100K doesn't change much, but it changes a lot below 100K. So uh, we have 
sort of a calibration curve, we have a thermometer. Uh, this particular one is a cryogenic thermometer because it works in the cryogenic range. And you can go up and down in temperature and it, it cycles very well. So it's quite stable. And it has a relative sensitivity, quite good relative sensitivity, about 6% per Kelvin at 25K, uh, so in the, it fall in the cryo cryogenic range. So we develop a lot of these uh, thermometers based on different metal frameworks, organic, uh, metal organic frameworks, and also one silicate or two. So now another example of applications of uh, metal organic frameworks we've been pursuing in our lab. And one is uh, mosquito, anti-mosquito nets. Of course, mosquito, mosquitoes are a huge problem, a lot, uh, much bigger problem than COVID is, I guess. Um, and uh, we would like to do something about it. Um, and so we, uh, we, we, we develop materials to be used in nets against mosquitoes. That's the, the, the bottom line. So we started with, uh, again, uh, a metal organic framework we just took from literature. In fact, uh, from a paper published by Christian uh, Clement Sanchez and Gérard Ferré, in 2009, beautiful structure in itself. It's uh, it's really fantastic structure, and this uh, bear this contains titanium, and it's a good photocatalyst. And just to give you an idea, if you take a probe molecule, uh, methylene blue, and if we study the photocatalytic degradation of methylene blue and the daylight irradiation, uh, what you see this is the curve here. Uh, in the absence of light, once light is turned on, it, it goes up degradation from about 30, 35 percent to over 75 percent. It works much better than a normal titanium oxide catalyst, commercial titanium oxide catalyst. So this is a photocatalyst. And so what we decided to do was we decided to take this moth and take some cotton or similar fabric and then coat the cotton fibers with with uh, with the crystals, moth crystals, and uh, these are just different magnifications. You can see the little moth crystals and the fibers, um, and uh, so and of course we wanted uh, to coat these, and we wanted a chemical coating. Otherwise, this would go out, uh, this would be removed. The, the crystals would disappear when you wash the net, or with time. So the idea is that a mosquito lands and a mosquito dies. It's very simple idea. And so uh, what we did is, as a glue, to glue the crystals to the, to the, to the, the fabric, we used an hybrid material, silicon uh, bearing hybrid material. And uh, of course, moth material is this, the linker is, is, is this one, and it can be derivatized with NH2. Uh, normally, the, uh, the fabrics also have resin, which uh, impart some uh, resistance, some mechanical properties. And of course, you have the fabrics with the OH groups. And with this ring, epoxy ring, of course, you can react with it, all these uh, functionalities. And, uh, and then also there are hydrogen bridging, bridges that can be built and so on. And in other words, this glue works very well and keeps the crystals attached to the surface to put it in a very simple way. So then we studied mosquito mortality uh, after 24 hours uh, um, by uh, uh, <clears throat> trying different concentrations on fabric from about two to six grams of metal organic framework per square, uh, per square meter. And we also tried different uh, fabrics. And you can see that uh, with six grams uh, per square meter, almost uh, all uh, mosquitoes are dead in the presence of light. In the dark, it's a different matter. We have much less uh, uh, mortality. Now, if we wash five times the nets, we still have 68% mortality. So a lot remains. And how does it work? We don't know exactly how it works. What we know is that mosquitoes sense CO2 and temperature. And, uh, and the moth causes some photodegradation of resin. So this resin, the resin which is there and imparts mechanical properties is decomposed. Some CO2 is produced uh, probably, and this attracts mosquitoes. Now, moth 
seems to be toxic to mosquitoes. We don't know why. It requires some, uh, uh, of course, uh, biological testing. But the fact of the matter is it kills uh, mosquitoes. Now I, I change, uh, I, I keep on uh, talking about um, hybrid materials. I, I slightly changed the topic. Uh, this is a much more recent work. We are now interested in ferroelectric materials, and, uh, but hybrid organic and organic uh, ferroelectric materials, which can be also for photoresponsive. So basically what we did, we self-assembled two types of components. On one hand, a framework building component, which is also photoresponsive, and that's a very well-known nitroprocide uh, ion. And in order to get uh, polar order, uh, we added some organic polar cations, such as dimethyl ammonium cation. And by self-assembly, we get a structure which uh, is ferroelectric at room temperature. Now, these are some of the proofs. Uh, DSC does show an order disorder phase transition uh, at about 4 to 3 Kelvin. XRD also shows uh, this phase transition. And then we did a single crystal uh, X-ray diffraction, so structure solving at uh, different temperatures, room temperature and higher temperatures. And what we see is that at room temperature, we have long range dipole ordering and remnant electric polarization along the C axis, which is destroyed when you, once you go up temperature, once you go through uh, that DSC peak. So we do have uh, order disorder transition and the starting material is ferroelectric. And uh, if we now measure the dielectric constant at different uh, frequencies and temperatures, that's a typical lambda time plot you get. And uh, we also study polarization reversal. So everything points to a uh, ferroelectric behavior. And uh, uh, in collaboration with a colleague in, in, uh, in my lab, uh, Andre Kulkin, we studied the main structure in local polarization reversal by piezoelectric force microscopy. I have no time to go into detail, but uh, we can study the nano domains or micro domains, uh, and we can also do domain switching in vertical um, PFM. That's quite interesting because the, uh, the component which builds up the framework is actually uh, um, also photoactive. And uh, at low temperature, though 77K, K, we, uh, we can observe photo-induced isomerization, and that's the infrared spectra upon 532 nanometers of radiation. And what we see is uh, uh, as, as we increase the irradiation time, certain bands here and there, they grow. And what we have there is, oh, sorry, what we have here is a ground state, uh, which is represented by this normal bond, nitrogen to, to ion. And to meet a stable state, this one here is oxygen binds ion, and that one makes a sort of, of a ring. And so, therefore, with using light, you can actually change, and that's basically what this picture wants to show, you can photo switch uh, from the ferroelectric ground state to two different metastable states. Hopefully, this will be able to also switch the uh, ferroelectricity of the system. Um, we have not done experiments yet at low temperature uh, measurement of ferroelectricity upon light emission, but we've done them separately. That's the next step. And now finally, uh, this is, uh, I think, an interesting story. I don't have time to go into much detail, but you can then have a look if you are interested. We just revisited an old problem uh, posed by Einstein, uh, Brownian motion, but in a particular regime. And we studied this Brownian, or we revisited this Brownian uh, motion by using nanocrystals, light uh, emitting nanocrystals, and a form of nanothermometry, not so different from what I've shown you in a moment, um, but uh, uh, using a procedure called up conversion or slightly different uh, light game, if you want. So you, you all know what 
the Brownian motion is, of course, this random motion of uh, uh, microscopic particles, liquids and gases, resulting from that collision with moving atoms or molecules. Uh, <clears throat> the pollen grains is, is what people normally think of. But in fact, we have uh, the mean square displacement is plotted here, time is here. And if you look at the different time scales, uh, there is a diffusive uh, regime. And that's what you people normally talk about when they talk about these pollen grains. And here we have this uh, mean square displacement proportional to t, to time. But there's then an hydrodynamic regime, and then there is below the moment of relaxation time, which is basically about 10 to minus 10 seconds for water, uh, we have the so-called ballistic regime. And, we, uh, and of course, there is an instantaneous um, Brownian velocity uh, in this uh, ballistic regime. And in 1907, Einstein wrote, due to the very rapid randomization of the motion, instantaneous velocity would be impossible to measure in practice, at least for ultramicroscopic particles, nano, nanoparticles, we would say uh, uh, nowadays. And so we thought, can we do it uh, with our nanothermometry measurements? And so uh, um, we basically took these uh, nanoparticles, they extremely bright nanoparticles, uh, core shell nanoparticles, um, fluoride uh, with a uh, core of yttrium, and then uh, uh, in the periphery of the core we have, uh, or sorry, uh, also uh, doped with ytterbium and erbium, and then there is a, um, a shell um, um, which is uh, of yttrium, which is inert, but it just protects uh, uh, from the outside world. And with these particles, by the way, we have almost one of dispersed particles, so quite, uh, quite narrow distribution, around 24 nanometers or so. So using these nanoparticles, we did the following experiment, and I'll try to explain this in a very, very simple way. So we had a cuvette, and inside this cuvette, we had water sprinkled with our nanocrystals. Uh, so they were here. They were uh, swimming in this, in this pool. And uh, we had a heater here. And we had a laser, 980 nine, nanometers laser, which we could move along this direction. And then there was a detector. So we would put, say, a laser here, and we would turn on the ether. And we were taking emission spectra every so often, OK, and measuring the temperature. And at a certain point, temperature starts rising up, and then it plateaus, OK? And then we repeated the experiment, in, uh, uh, just moving the laser to another position. And by doing that, we add plots uh, like this, produce plots like this. So this is the position, and that's the uh, the time that takes, or the time the time of, of the experiment. And so, for example, here, uh, um, position eight millimeters from 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 ether. Uh, okay, we had to wait uh, about. Well, I don't know, 40, 45 five, uh, seconds, or whatever, until we started getting spectra, emission spectra, which changed, and uh, we could convert that into temperature. And temperature was rising with time until it plateaus. Okay? <clears throat> then we moved to another position, and we did it again. And so we had this delay before temperature starts to increase can then be plot, it's what we call critical time, and then can be plotted again the uh, position, and we consider different volume fractions, so more or less crystals in, uh, in the water, and we got straight lines. And it's interesting for diluted samples, for these samples here, we have Brownian velocity, or we have a velocity which is uh, uh, <coughs> very, very close or equal within experimental error to the instantaneous Brownian velocity and that's the value. All the paper is in showing that this is indeed Brownian, instantaneous Brownian velocity and not something else. And uh, it, we also uh, shown that, at least at low concentrations, these instantaneous Brownian velocity is independent of particle size and shape and solvent. So we changed, we produced nanoparticles with uh, uh, cylindrical shapes, for example, and so on. And this method also allows you to measure uh, uh, <clears throat> connect, uh, convective heat transfer coefficients, which is difficult for these ferrofluids. So uh, I think my time is almost up. Um, 
and I hope I, uh, I hope I, you, I hope I have conveyed to you some of the ideas we have been developing in Aveiro for quite some time, mainly along the lines of silicates, uh, nanopore silicates, and uh, organic and inorganic hybrids, and in many cases, metallogenic frameworks. Um, and that there's a lot of applications which we can be foreseen, and many are not found with common zeolite type materials, or I would say common metal game frameworks, at least those who do not bear any lanthanide ions. And now just to finish, uh, I, I of course would like to thank many of my French uh, co-authors uh, over many, many years. So. Uh, Christian Fernandez, Dominique Massieu, Jean-Paul Amoureux, surtout au niveau RMN. Uh, Marie-Hélène Delville, uh, we've made a lot of uh, work and several co to tell um, on the subject of nanoparticles. Uh, I, I did not mention this, this work. Uh, Pierre Rabou, uh, Zamel, uh, Zelimir Gabelik uh, in the old days, on, uh, mainly on doing uh, NMR for his zeolite work. And people who have influenced me a lot because they've been good friends and they've been uh, um, providing advice in many occasions. Clement Sanchez and Jean Tourneau, they were, they were both part of a, a fame, a European fame a network. I was part of this network as well. Uh, Christian Serre, Pierre Bronstein, we're both in the European Academy of Sciences and uh, so we exchange a lot of ideas as well. And of course, I cannot finish uh, without uh, acknowledging some of my collaborators over the years. Uh, uh, much of the work, uh, photoluminescence work, is done with uh, my colleague Luis Carlos, who is uh, uh, in the physics department, is an expert on photoluminescence of lanthanides, and now with Enrico Keen, who is an expert on uh, uh, um, uh, PFM. And then the other colleagues uh, involved in uh, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, different parts of my work. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.